Yet another controversial JJK chapter just dropped, and the ending of this massive manga is attracting a lot of excitement, but also a lot of hate. The truth about Utah revealed, the return of characters we thought were dead, and the twist in the end that was dark, so let's get into it. You guys know this works, if you enjoy my JJK content and you want to see more in the future, leave a quick like and comment for that YouTube algorithm. And if you want to make sure that you're going to be notified for my reviews of the final chapters of JJK, please click subscribe right now and also hit that notification bell to turn on all notifications. You've stuck with me for this long, so don't miss my reviews of the final chapters because YouTube doesn't notify you because you're not subscribed. Man, who could forget that last chapter, which was possibly the most insane and unexpected chapter in the whole series, and that's saying a lot after Gojo's off-screen death that broke the internet and polarized the fandom like never before. The chapter began with Megumi and Sukuna's soul talking to each other inside of Megumi's body, and Sukuna was trying to persuade Megumi to just give up on everything and continue passively watching as Sukuna uses his body to take over the world. Sukuna reminded Megumi that he took everything away from him and that Megumi had no reason to live anymore. But this time, Megumi didn't give in. Megumi sensed how desperate Sukuna was sounding, and he sensed that even the great Sukuna was afraid of death. This led Megumi to a major realization. Sukuna really can be defeated, and in fact, he's actually extremely close to defeat. That is why he is so desperate and so scared. And so, instead of taking Sukuna's advice and giving up, Megumi is motivated to do the opposite. He decides to fight back against Sukuna and to resist him, not necessarily for himself, but for the sake of other people. He decides to live on for the sake of others and to help defeat Sukuna for their sake. Sukuna's soul then finally loses its grip on Megumi's body and we see that Megumi has become his old self again with his normal hair color. Meanwhile, Sukuna has turned into some grotesque amalgamation of limbs and eyes and teeth that reminds me of the creatures from Parasite the Maxim. But even though those creatures are extremely dangerous and deadly, Sukuna is not. Not anymore. His parasite form quickly turns into a pathetic blob form that looks more like the true form of Envy from Fullmetal Alchemist than an actually dangerous and deadly alien. In his final moments, Sukuna witnesses Yuji looking down on him and pitying him for what he has become. Yuji even offers to honor his deal from before and allow for Sukuna's soul to keep living inside of him, but Sukuna refuses because that would be too humiliating for him. After Sukuna apparently dies, Uraume also chooses to die rather than accept that Sukuna could ever be defeated. Uraume even copes by saying that the modern sorcerers are just lucky that they didn't have to face Prime Heia and Sukuna, and that they were fighting a reincarnated curse instead of Sukuna at his full power. After the apparent deaths of both Sukuna and Uraume, the chapter went through a drastic tonal shift. We skipped to the moment that the now fully recovered Megumi wakes up and finds his besties Yuji and Nobara trying to play a practical joke on him. They then proceeded to drink some tea while Nobara and Megumi read personal letters that their former sensei Gojo had left them. Nobara's letter contained info about her mother and what she's doing now, which is all stuff that Nobara claims not to be interested in. I say claims because she might just want the guys to think that she doesn't care, so we'll have to wait and see. Megumi's letter is much funnier because it literally just says, Sorry Megumi, but your dad's a goner. I wasted his ass. My bad. <laughs> that is our boy Gojo. You gotta give it to him. Even from beyond the grave, he is still an absolutely hilarious, eccentric badass. The chapter ends with the trio going off to see Maki, Panda, Inumaki, Kusakabe, Miwa, and Momo. And they're not just meeting up with them for fun. Instead, they're trying to meet in order to save Yuta because there is seemingly something wrong with him. Since the chapter ended on that cliffhanger regarding Yuta's fate, it sparked a ton of speculation about what might be going on with him now. Like, is he stuck inside of Gojo's body? Is he going to survive or is he dying? What is going on with his original body? What is going on with Rika? The chapter left us with all those questions swirling in our heads, and thankfully we do know the answers to those questions now, thanks to the new chapter. The latest chapter begins with confirmation that Yuta is now back in his original body. He's got that trendy Kenjaku scar on his forehead, as expected, but otherwise he seems to be back to his old self again. However, we see that Maki is telling a nervous looking Yuta that the fact that he's back in his original body doesn't mean that everything is good now. Everyone was there at the end of the last chapter is also there now, standing around Yuta. Maki asks Megumi how he's doing, and he says that he's feeling a bit hazy because of some lingering effects of Infinite Void, but otherwise he seems fine. He proceeds to apologize to everyone for kind of giving up there at one point and allowing Sukuna to have his way with his body, but Maki tells him to save it because he's got nothing to apologize for. 
Kusakabe then says that all this mess started when Gojo decided to spare Yuji's life instead of just killing him as soon as he became a vessel for Sukuna. Kusakabe also says that he totally supported just game ending Yuji back then, but Yaga was the one who convinced him to trust Gojo. Kusakabe proclaims that at the end of the day, no one's perspective was necessarily wrong. Each truth is woven together like a beautiful tapestry in order to create the now, the present moment. Because of this, Kusakabe tells Megumi Yuji and Nobara that they have nothing to feel guilty about. Everyone played a part in getting to where they are now, and that is how it was meant to be. He also tells Megumi to chill out and act his age because his insane levels of maturity are making the adults look bad. Yuji then asks how Yuta managed to return to his own body, since with Kenjaku being dead and Yuta no longer being able to copy his technique, he should have been stuck inside Gojo's body. Yuta explains that it was all thanks to Rika. At first he thought that the two of them had lost their connection because she didn't follow him when he entered Gojo's body, and she stayed with his original body instead. But in reality, Rika didn't just stay behind with Yuta's body to cry and mope about the fact that he was no longer there. Instead, she was actually working to heal and repair his body the whole time, and with the help of Shoko's reverse curse technique, Yuta's body was sufficiently healed to host his soul again. Then, when Yuta inside Gojo's body was defeated and was about to die, Rika somehow managed to reconnect to him in his quasi-dead state, and she managed to return him to his original body. Not exactly sure how this works, we'll have to wait for the official translation to see if it's gonna be fully explained, but it might not be, it might be just one of those things. Yuta apologizes for worrying everyone, and of course no one seems to be actually upset with him, except for maybe Maki. Maki goes on to say that the sorcerers could have won much easier if Yuta had managed things better. She starts like Monday night quarterbacking and explaining how they could have crushed Sukuna if only she had been the one to lead the attacks, and if only they had timed their attacks differently and combined them in different ways. Toto pushes back a bit, arguing that the way that they did things made sense, and that doing things differently could have actually backfired. We then learn that Higuruma is still alive, even though it looked like he might have been killed in that fight against Sukuna. His left arm is in a cast and he is definitely injured, but he is alive and moving around on his own, which is saying a lot given how many people had just assumed that Higuruma was dead and chilling with Gojo in the afterlife. As Higuruma starts giving his own take on the strategies that they had used to defeat Sukuna, Kusakabe is shocked that Higuruma managed to survive that fight, given the fact that he had been a sorcerer for only like two months, and before that he was just a regular human lawyer. But to be fair, the fact that Higuruma is abnormally strong and an incredibly quick study has been established long ago, but yeah, still pretty crazy when you think about it. Maki then starts complaining that if Miguel and LaRue would have been there from the start, things would have gone a lot differently. But Yuta explains that they didn't even know if those two would actually show up in the end. After all, they used to be loyal to Ghetto before he was killed by Gojo, so they couldn't exactly be counted on to risk their lives to save Ghetto's old enemies from Sukuna. At the end of the day though, they won in large part thanks to Yuta and his cursed tools, and apparently Yuji's special gauntlets were actually cursed tools provided by Yuta. Without Yuta providing the opportunity, Yuji probably never would have been able to unleash his domain against Sukuna in the right moment. The rest of the people there, including Hakari, Ino, and Kirara, continue to talk about the fight, what went wrong, what could have been done better, and who was to blame for the failures. I won't bother talking about all of it, it's just a discussion of the specific details of the fight that provides some additional context for those of you who are really interested. It's interesting stuff if you're really into the battle system in JJK, but since this fight is now already in the past, I won't focus on it too much in this review. I will say that it was funny to see Hakari say that he was planning to take on Sukuna after dealing with Uraume, but then he didn't have to because Sukuna was already defeated. Even Momo says that she was waiting to fight Sukuna if it came down to it, but thankfully he didn't because let's be real, Sukuna would have bodied Momo so freaking fast. But yeah, these guys really did prepare for everything. They had so many different plans and scenarios and backup scenarios in the works. And at the end of the day, it really was that planning and teamwork that got them over the finish line. Say what you will about the end of JJK, but this definitely wasn't a case of the main character just getting angry and powering up enough to defeat the villain himself. All these different characters worked very hard to make this happen, and the specific ways in which they timed and combined their powers really made the difference. Including of course Nobara's clutch resonance attack there near the very end. At this point, Uyui tries to claim that he was actually the MVP of the whole fight, and I mean he did save the lives of some important characters, no doubt about it, but the MVP was clearly the GOAT, Hajime Kashimo. Dude waited like 400 years to fight Sukuna, and then the fight lasted a whole half a chapter, so you know, goaded stuff. Anyway, then we see Meimei being Meimei, and we also get an explanation about the intricacies of new Shadow Style Simple Domain, and how it works. 
They also talk about how the new Shadow style has been kept as a closely guarded secret up to this point. Only the students of the new Shadow Style clan have been able to learn this secretive technique. And because of this, there are a bunch of rules that they have to abide by, such as not teaching others and never refusing a deployment from the head of the clan. There's even talk about students of this technique being forced to sacrifice some of their lifespan, which is seemingly then absorbed by the secret head of the clan. Kusakabe then shockingly reveals that he is actually the new head of the clan, and that means that everyone can use the new Shadow Style now. The restrictions and secrecy surrounding it have now been lifted. Mei Mei and Ui Ui then talk about the potential financial perks of I guess people needing to pay a subscription to learn this style? Which is hopefully just a joke, and then the chapter abruptly shifts focus to a new scene. And this scene is actually taking place in the past, before the scene that we just witnessed. We see Mei Mei visiting an old lady whom she accuses of being the secret head of the new Shadow Style clan that apparently intended to dominate the entire sorcery world along with the main sorcerer headquarters. It seems that Tengen herself was the one who revealed the old lady's true identity to Mei Mei. Mei Mei then seems to confirm that this woman was indeed harvesting the life force of the clan's students and then she says something no one expected her to say. She says that some things are more precious than even money. But in order to protect those things, you often need money. And there were many sorcerers who could have lived if they had not been shackled by the simplified domain rules that the head of the clan had imposed. Mei Mei then goes on to take out the old woman, and because of her death, Kusakabe inherits the title of the head of the clan. That was a pretty crazy and dark twist at the end of the chapter, and now that Tengen was mentioned, I am really wondering what is happening with Tengen and the merger now. That is like the last big unresolved piece of the puzzle, and at one point we were led to believe that Sukuna literally absorbed Tengen's cocoon, so what does that mean? Is Tengen dead? Alive? Is the merger still gonna happen? Is this a plot point that will just be left unresolved? Let me know what you guys think about this Tengen situation down in the comments. Overall, this chapter felt more like a debriefing or like a post-game breakdown of all the strategies and moves used during the Sukuna fight and how they actually worked. This wasn't exactly unexpected from Gege since he takes great pride in developing the complex and nuanced Jujutsu battle system, so he wants everything to make sense and he doesn't want any parts of the battle system to be seen as some sort of nonsensical ass pull. That said, there are a lot of people who were expecting more from the third final chapter of JJK. They wanted new reveals, time skips, finding out what happens to everyone in the end, how much stronger they become, who hooks up with who, all that type of stuff. I mean, there is still room for that in the last two chapters, but some people are still unhappy that the third to last chapter was just a post-game analysis of a fight that is already over. And combining that with the fact that a lot of people, especially Sukuna fans, really hated how the last chapter ended and how the Sukuna fight ended, and you get a whole bunch of drama on social media. Do you guys agree with the drama? Was this a bad third to last chapter? Has this been a bad ending so far? Or do you think we needed something exactly like this at this point in the story? Do you think that the final two chapters will also just kind of plug some loose ends? Or are we going to get a crazy reveal that maybe sets up a potential sequel to JJK? Could we maybe get an international spin-off that focuses on Jujutsu sorcerers outside of Japan? Don't forget to share your thoughts down in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like to let me know. And if you want to be sure that you won't miss my reviews of the last two chapters of JJK, do me a huge favor and subscribe right now and also hit that notification bell to turn on all notifications.